pray with me. Father, as we open up your word, we ask that you would open up our minds, our hearts. I ask, Father, that you would not only cause us to hear now, but to listen later. That you would seal your words to our hearts because there's promises for those who abide with you and who abide in your word. And so, Lord, we ask that you would superintend as we worship you. Speak, Lord, for your servants are listening. In Jesus' name, amen. This is a Bible. They call it a holy Bible. What's so holy about it? You see, holy means that it is separate. It is distinct. It is in a class all by itself. Why? Because it's the word of God. And it's not just the word of God. It's the words from God to you to me, to guide us, to lead us. God says it this way, all scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, correcting, rebuking, and training in righteousness. And so we honor this word here while we do see some churches today are moving away from this. We do not because this is where truth is. And we know that if we study the truth, we live the truth, what will the truth do? Set us free. And so this morning, what we're doing is we're looking back at Jonah. Initially, I said it was more than a fish story. You know, when we growing up, if you grew up in church, I did not. But if you grew up in church, you knew about Jonah and the fish. Well, it's more than a fish story. The next question we asked up front was, is it a fairy tale or is it fact? A lot of folks, because of its supernatural events, such as the fish swallowing Jonah and him being in the fish for three days and three nights, say, well, that can't be true. It must be a fairy tale. And I'm talking about people who are Bible scholars say fairy tale. It's a fact. Jesus declared it as a fact when he gave himself as an example that he was going to be in the grave for three days and three nights, just like Jonah. Was that a fairy tale he was talking about? No, it was real. And we know that Jonah is also a real character. He appears one other place in the Bible. And so we know that he is a real person and this is a real story. So we say this is fact. Who is the main character in the book of Jonah? Is it Jonah? Is it the fish? We said it's God. God is the one who has the first word. If you read through it, he has the first word. He has the last word. And as a matter of fact, he has the first word and the last word in your life. Today, I'm calling this Jonah for today four takeaways. And so we're looking back at Jonah. This is the last message on Jonah. And we're looking back at it and saying, okay, when I think of Jonah, what lessons do I think of? What practical advantage do I get from this? Do I get just knowledge? Or do I get entertainment? Or do I get something that will benefit my life? The Bible is a very practical book. The Bible also is a very inspirational book. And one of the things that I learned well, full well in seminary was that it is a sin to bore people with the word of God. I pray that I don't do that to you because it does not bore me. I see this as something that applies to me and I'm excited about following it. Not always because I don't like some of the things it says. But again, God gets the first word and the last word. And so Paul, in writing to the Corinthians, said this, 
these happen. He was talking about the Jews and, and he was talking about Old Testament history. These things happened to them as examples for us. They were written down to warn us who live at the end of the age. So what things did God record for Jonah for us even today? Although we're not the original audience. You do know that, right? Who was the original audience? Israel. Israel had the same attitude that Jonah had. He was reflective of what they all felt. They all felt that they were special, they were God's chosen people, but they were God's chosen people to reach the other nations and to be a blessing to them. And they had given up on that and just grown comfortable. And they didn't want to reach out anymore. Same with Jonah. <laughs> this is not Jonah, okay? So what? You should ask yourself this question as you read through the Bible. So what? I see this. I see that this means this. So what does it mean to me? How should I apply this to my life today? So what? You'll notice that every week I answer that question at the end of my sermons. Again, because this is a very practical book. And so what? There are four lessons, there's more, but four lessons from the book of Jonah that I want to leave you with. One, obey God. Obey God, leave the consequences to him. It's uh, a famous because that's the way he lived his life. When he was visiting with his grandfather before he was... Uh, he's, I think, high school heading into college at the point, at that point, if I remember right. And his grandfather was a preacher. He didn't know him well, but he asked him, said, do you have any advice for me? And his grandfather said, obey God. Pretty good advice, isn't it? If God tells you to put your head through a brick wall, put your head down and start running towards that wall, is what he told him. He said, when you get there, God will open up a hole for you. You see, so obey God, leave the consequences to him. Jonah didn't get that. Matter of fact, we don't get it quite a bit. We're, there's a Jonah in all of us. Well, that's not for me. That's for the person sitting next to me. They need to hear this. Number two, God will not ignore rebellion. There are people in your life, and maybe there's some things that you're getting away with, but maybe there's people in your life that are getting away with something. And you know it. You see, as we'll discuss here further, Billy Graham had said, sin, all sin, is rebellion against God. We think, well, it's just a little white sin. And God said, no, no, you're intentionally rebelling against me. Number three, God is sovereign. And what have we said, and I'll bring it out in this message again, because I want to implant that in your mind. What does sovereign mean? God is large and in charge. Okay? It's just very simple. God is large and in charge. He's in charge of everything. And then God's love for all, even the unlovable. Okay, first point. Obey God. Jonah thought he could avoid God's call by running away. If I just get away from God, he won't bother me. We'll act like it just didn't happen. I'm just heading the other direction. We know that God wanted him to go right, and he went left as far as he could go. The second thing, Jonah thought he could avoid God's call by sacrificing himself. Sometimes we do that, too. I think one of the common areas that we do it today is we say, you know, I know God wants me to share Jesus with other people, but that just really makes me uncomfortable. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to put a few more bucks in the plate and uh, maybe I'll give a little bit more to a missionary, which are all good things to do. But God wants you to have the joy, the 
of sharing him with other folks. And so God says, rather than giving me more of your sacrifices, how about obeying me? He says it this way in 1 Samuel 15, 22, to obey is better than sacrifice. To obey is better than sacrifice. That's what God wants from us first and foremost, to listen and do what he said. Jonah thought he could avoid God's call by belligerent obedience. All right, God, I'm here. You happy now? I spoke what you wanted me to speak to him. I hope you're happy now, God. Oh, look, they're turning away from their sin. That is not what I wanted at all. I wanted to see them, I wanted to see them slaughtered. Belligerent obedience doesn't cover it. So Jonah is teaching, we're learning these lessons through Jonah. The original audience, Israel, is looking at it and saying, is that us? That's uncomfortable. That's what we've been doing. Number four, Jonah thought that he could nullify God's call by sulking. Remember, he gave him an ultimatum. God, if you're not going to kill them, just kill me. I don't think he really wanted to die. We don't know. The scripture's silent on it. But it kind of makes sense that he's saying, if you're not going to kill them, kill me. Lessons for today. It is impossible to run away from God. Jonah teaches us that. It's a good reminder to us that you cannot run away from God. You can't pack your bag and your teddy bear and get on a train and go where you want to go. He's there too. This is the way God says it in Psalm 138, verses 7 and 8. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, well, you're there. If I make my bed in the depths, you're there too. God is omnipresent. He's everywhere. But you know what? We don't so much run away as we drift away today. I find even in my own life, if I'm not intentional about spiritual disciplines of prayer, of spending time with God, of reading his word for me and allowing it to impact my life, I can drift. We drift from the church. Maybe we just stop going for a while. We don't mean anything by it. We just get busy and we just kind of drift away. And we drift away from the Bible. You know, I'm busy today. Uh, I'll get it tomorrow. And then tomorrow's start to stack up. And, well, you're not reading. And then the family of God. We start pulling away from the family of God. It's a gradual slipping away. And it ends up without God's influence. We end up in disobedience, not doing the things he wants us to do. Does that make sense to any of you? I know it does to me. Dang. Disobedience creates turmoil in the believer's life. One of the things that I have recognized, and you know too, God loves you as you are. We're not perfect. God loves you as you are, but, as you are, but too much to leave you the way you are. Like Jonah, he'll hunt you down. And when we start to drift, that isn't what he wants for you. He wants the best for you, and he knows he's the best for you. And this is where God, out of his great mercy and his great love, started chasing Jonah down. Did God need Jonah? No. Does God need you or me? No, he doesn't. He wants to use you. He wants to use me. He wants us to walk closely with him because he is what's best for us. This is a picture of my cell phone. This is what Patty sees when I call. <laughs> Don't tell her, okay? No, she's smarter than that. So am I. I'm not going to do that. But how does God call us? He calls us when we're drifting, when we're even running away. 
He'll call you through the storms in your life. All of a sudden, some of these things are just life, but some of them he'll make it clear to you. You're not walking with him. And all of a sudden, worry enters into your life. And worry turns into anxiety. And anxiety, when it goes too far, it starts telling you when you'll eat. It tells you when you'll sleep. It tells you when you'll be able to relax. The gnawing in your stomach just continues. God may put some, allow something else into your life. Maybe it is a health issue. Maybe he's trying to teach you something through it. Maybe he allowed it. Maybe he brought it directly into your life. And by the way, their choice. Everything that comes into your life has either been ordained by God. In other words, he directly caused it to happen or he allowed it to happen. In either case, he'll use it for your good, but he requires that you go to him. And so the storms of life, what storms have you lived through in your life? Amen. Sometimes we created them on ourselves. And one of the things I've learned to pray when something comes in to my life, I'll go to God and say, God, is there sin in my life that you're trying to reveal to me that you want to excise this from my life? Or is this something you just want me to learn a lesson in? Please help me to know. Because if it's my sin... I want to confess it and get over with this because I want to learn this lesson quickly. But not everything comes out of sin. Sometimes God's just teaching you. And sometimes he'll entrust you with things because he knows you're strong enough. That's what I'm seeing in Pat's life now. Is God has entrusted this to her. And he is greatly testing both of us. But he knows that she's strong enough, and he strengthens her. And we pray for strength every single day as we go through this. We thought we were going to be through this cancer, and right as we reach that finish line, it's like, oh, sorry, another tumor. And now we're waiting for the surgeon. They say it's urgent, but the phone's not ringing. We keep calling them, and so we don't know. But here's what I'm doing, and here's what I want you to do. I want you in your life, <clears throat> and we're doing it right now, and would you pray it for us? I'm praying for a miracle for Patty. I'm praying for a miracle that they would do the tests and the doctors would come back and say, I don't know why you're here. I don't know what tumor you're talking about, but there's nothing there. That's what we're asking God for. Now, do I get to instruct God? No, I don't. But as a child, I can go to him and I can ask. You don't have because you don't ask is what he says. And so I take him up on it. I advise you to do that in your life too. It can be deflating because I realize we are setting ourselves up for disappointment if God says, that's not my plan, Keith. Patty's going to go through this surgery. Well, then I realize I'm a two-year-old asking God because I can't do this on my own. And I accept that. And Patty and I have had that conversation more than once. And she's doing the same thing. She said, I don't get to tell God, but I am going to ask my daddy if he would just heal me. And we will tell everyone. We'll call the newspapers. We'll call everybody because we want God to get the glory. Not because we're better than anybody. But I want people to know that there's a good God in heaven who loves us. Sometimes we think, my failure, I'm done. God could never forgive me for this. But failure does not disqualify one from God's service. Don't we see that with Jonah? God said, go, and Jonah said, no, I'm not going. That's a failure. But God gave him a second chance because God is a God of second chances and third and fourth and fifth. It won't disqualify you, but he does require that you'll go back to him humbly. With God, failure is not final. Remember that. We see that with Jonah. We see that with God's heart, willing to forgive Jonah 
and continue to use them when he didn't have to. For those who will obey, here's a great promise. Trust in the Lord. A little bit? Half a heart? All your heart. Do not depend on your own understanding. God, you know what I think? If you want to make, do you know how to make God laugh? Give him advice. Sometimes we do that. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lord, I don't understand what's going on here. And Lord, I don't like it. I want to be honest. But I'm going to trust you in this. Do not depend on your own understanding. Seek his will in all you do. How do you want me to work through this, Lord? And he'll show you which path to take. That's a promise from God to you today. Jonah didn't do that. Jonah chose to take the hard way out of this. Think about all that he would have escaped if he would have just listened to God. Simply, in summary, obey God. Understanding lies on the other side of obedience. Oswald Chambers said something about that. I think that's a direct quote, but I'm pulling it from my memory, so it's probably not. But God will ask you to do certain things, or you may get an impression he wants you to do something, and you don't understand why. Follow him. If you know he's telling you to do it, do it. You won't understand until you get on the other side of it and look back. And you still may not understand it then, but many times you will. If you don't obey God, you step into sin. And as I've already mentioned, sin is rebellion against God. Billy Graham said that. He's not the only one, but it's true. When we dig our heels in, God said, that's rebellion against me. And we say, well, God, I just don't want to do it. And God said, see, that's rebellion. God will not ignore rebellion. This is the second lesson I want you to see out of Jonah. God will not ignore rebellion. We see Jonah, he was around 785 BC. That's when he served. That's when he, around that time is when he went to Nineveh. And we can see in this book how God dealt with him in his rebellion. But what you don't know, you may know this, you may not, but history shows us that Jonah was a representative of Israel. I've already said that. Jonah was a representative of the way Israelites felt about all other peoples. They had become self-centered, self-serving. They were doing really well. Their nation was expanding, and they got rather independent, and they stopped following God. My guess is the synagogues were full, and the churches were full, if we could say it that way. The churches were full, but their hearts had become empty. Kind of sounds familiar today, doesn't it? I don't think that's what we have here, but we do have a lot of folks who are pop empty. Assyria conquered Israel. Israel didn't turn. They kept going the way they were headed. And God had promised them when he brought them into the promised land at 1,700 years before that, approximately, God had said, you do these things, I'll bless you. You do these things, I'm going to curse you. God had great patience with them for 700 years. The northern part that they call Israel, they didn't even have one good king. They're all evil, all self-serving. Finally, God said, enough. Assyria, Nineveh was part of Assyria. They conquered Israel in a bloodbath in 722 B.C. And then to make sure that Assyria paid for that, Babylon conquered Assyria in 612 B.C. And then Persia conquered Babylon. God will, are you getting, are you seeing the, the pattern here? God will not ignore rebellion. How much longer do we have? You're all asking the same question, aren't you? 
how much more will God take from us? I can tell you the USA is not forever. We know there's a new world order coming. We know there's an antichrist. We don't know when he's coming. And if I understand prophecy right, you, if you've trusted in Jesus Christ, you're not going to It's not coming until we are raptured out of here. But he will be a one world leader. And then we know well after that, there's going to be a new heaven and earth. So the USA is not forever anyway. But you know what? This is a great country. And this is a country that's been free for the gospel to travel around the world. This is a country where we are free to worship. I'm praying that God lets us stay strong as a country as long as we can so we can continue to spread the gospel. A sovereign God who will not ignore rebellion. Listen to what Daniel wrote. Praise the name of God forever and ever, for he has all wisdom and power. He controls the course of world events. He removes kings and he sets up other kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to the scholars. God is sovereign. He's large and in charge. You may agree with the, the current leadership of our country or maybe you don't, but I can tell you this, they're in there because God put them in there. That's what this says. And I think some of the things we're suffering as a country now is because we deserve it. We've not been faithful. Now, what can we do? Is Washington calling anybody here? God did not promise to work through the White House, right? He promised to work through the church house. You as a believer in Jesus Christ, God hears your prayers. And so we pray for our country. We pray for our leaders. We pray for our president, the vice president, the Congress, that God would get a grip on them. Sometimes I pray that they would be so sobered, understanding that they will stand before God. And God will say, I gave you that position. How, did, how faithful to me were you with it? It's going to be very sobering for some. God is sovereign. We see this in the book Jonah. He stirred up a storm out of nowhere. Jonah ran away and God stirred up a storm to get him to turn around. And once they threw him overboard, what happened? That. Instantly, the water went calm. Just like when Jesus, many years later, rebuked in the New Testament, rebuked the wind and the storm and calm. That's a sovereign God. He can turn a storm in your life into calm right away. But he is asking for you to follow him. And he'll do it when he's ready. We see the sovereignty of God in the casting of lots when the, when the sailors said, what are we going to do here? And they said, well, let's cast lots to see whose fault it is. God made sure the lot fell on Jonah. The fish, God appointed a fish. Once they threw Jonah in, God appointed a fish to swallow him. God appointed later on a plant to give him comfort. And then he also appointed the worm. You see, God is sovereign over the events of mankind. God is also sovereign over all of creation. But you know what he's not, it doesn't look like he's sovereign over? Well, he was sovereign over the great revival in Nineveh. He opened up the hearts and minds of the people to see him. And they trusted. Here's the irony. All creation obeys God except his servant. Another message to Israel and a message to us today. Am I walking with Jesus to the best of my ability to obey him? Because God wants to reach others through me. You know, he wants to reach others through you, your friends, your neighbors, those who see you in daily life. Do they see someone who is kind, who is loving, not perfect, not pretending to be perfect, just someone that loves them?
Daniel 4.34, this is in 35, this is one of those verses that clearly depicts the sovereignty of God. This was spoken by Nebuchadnezzar, the most powerful man on earth at that time. And he said these words, God's rule is everlasting and his kingdom is eternal. He's not elected. He doesn't go in and out of office. All the people of the earth are nothing compared to him. None. Even this, the most powerful man on earth, is nothing compared to God. He does as he pleases among the angels of heaven and among the people of the earth. Who can stop him, right? No one can stop him. No one can say to him, what do you mean by doing these things? God's large and in charge. He does what he wants, when he wants. If I had to point to something right now that has kept Patty and me at peace, and you all know this all started with us on October 27th, and it scared the daylights out of me because Patty went from healthy to emergency surgery to having cancer all within a week. And we didn't see any of it coming. And I had to face the fact that maybe I'm going to lose my wife. And we're still in the midst of it. So many things, said so many things so well, the Prince of Preachers. He said, when you go through a trial, the sovereignty of God is the pillow upon which you lay your head. It's true. Absolutely true. The only peace I get in all of this is knowing that God the Father loves me. More importantly, he loves Patty. She's his daughter. And he has allowed this for his reasons. Now, I know he's going to heal her. I'm praying he chooses to heal her here, not there. But I know she's going to be healed. I know she'll be cancer-free. There's no doubt. I know that I know that I know that she's going to heaven because she's such a great wife and such a godly woman. No, I mean, she is. But because she took God as his word. And she trusted alone in Christ alone as the only way to heaven. She took God up on his promise. Last, the love of God. I think this is an important lesson out of Jonah. Is the love of God for the unlovable. We've had conversations about that where I've told you that the Ninevites, the Assyrian people, were bloody, barbaric. They tortured people. They didn't just kill them. They tortured them first. And then to scare everybody when they conquered a city, they would decapitate the people and stack their skulls outside just as a, a warning, we're coming. Do they deserve the love of God? Israelites said no. God said yes. Does that mean he loved what they did? No. But he reached out through them. The love for a rebellious prophet. He had love for the people of Nineveh who shook their fists at him. He had love for the rebellious Israelites who were shaking their fists at him. God is patient. And may I remind you that this is his day of grace. This is the day of salvation. If you're not trusted in Christ, today's the day to do it. You can't see too clearly with this uh, with camera. But can you see what's in that man's hand? What's in that man's hand is a hammer. There's a hammer in your hand. There's a hammer in my hand. We all nailed Jesus to the cross. And there are times when we say, Lord, I just let you down again. You know what he says? Child, you don't hold me up. I hold you up.
this in a nutshell is what Jesus said that you need to know. Because if you've trusted in Jesus, this is, again, a reminder for you and for me and those of us who have trusted in Christ that it's not a gamble, are we going to heaven? It's a surety. For God so loved you. The world there, you could translate it. I mean, it says cosmos, but it means the world means you. For God so loved you. That's the love of God. That's the love of God we see in Jonah, that he even loved the Assyrians, those who are living in Nineveh. For God so loved you that he gave you a gift, that he gave his one and only son, Jesus. In 2,000 years, Jesus came and he went to the cross and he laid his life down on the cross. He did it to pay for all of our rebellion all of our sins, everything we've done wrong. Once for all is what the Bible says. Jesus paid it all. He paid for your sins and my sins, past, present, and future. Think about it. How many of your sins were future when Jesus died on the cross? All of them. Jesus paid it all. Now God looks at you, or Jesus looks at you. Will you accept my payment? You see, God stamped Jesus' ticket. Jesus' receipt that God the Father had accepted Jesus' payment was the resurrection. And Jesus lives today. And so... What do you need to do to get to heaven? Again, I remind you, these are Jesus' words. This is, a, this is an all-inclusive statement. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son for this purpose, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. What's the list of things you need to do to go to heaven? It's one. One thing. You must trust alone in Christ alone is the way I put it. Believe, trust is the verb form. You must trust in Jesus that he paid it all. Have you done that? If you have not, today's your day. Go quietly to God. You can do it right here, right now. You can do it at home. But go to him and say, I, God, I understand that Jesus paid it all. I understand I'm a sinner. I've done wrong. I miss the mark. I get mad. I do these things. God, forgive me. Right now, I'm trusting in Jesus as the only way. Amen. God, save me. Amen. And he will. If you've never spoken those words to God, you need to do it. They're not magic words. But God wants you to come to him. When we get to the end of the New Testament in 1 John 4, 8. God is love. He summarizes it and God said, let me make this really clear to you now that you've been through just about the entire Bible. Let me make it real clear to you. God is love. So for today, here's four lessons that I want you, when you think of Jonah, here's the lessons. God being the main character of the book, there are four things we learn about God for you that are practical lessons for us every day. One, obey God. Obey God means to say, yes, Lord. Leave the consequences to him. Trust him. There's a promise there. Psalm 1 says, Bless the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked or stand in the way of sinners or sit in the seat of mockers, but he delights in your word. He listens to you. He obeys you. There's a blessing in that. One thing we learned today, obey God from the book of Jonah. We saw what his life looked like. It didn't go well. Number two, God will not ignore rebellion. Again, sin is rebellion against God. We can sit there and go la, 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 la all day long. But God has spoken, and he has not stuttered. It's very clear. He wants you to obey him. And he will bless you for your obedience. Number three, 
God is large and in charge. We can worry and fret about what's happening in our country, but I'm telling you, God put those in office who are there now. And if they're not doing what God wants, we need to pray for people that God will put in office who will. And we may need to stand up, and we will definitely have to vote. And who do you vote for? I hear people say, well, I don't, is that the best we've got? Look, don't look at the men, look at their policies. And look at their policies and their platforms. What aligns with the Bible? Which ones align closest with the Bible? And you go with that person. But don't walk away and don't vote. We do have to vote. We are given that privilege. And the third thing is God is love. This is one of the things that gets us through every day. Patty and I know that God is love. He knows that he, we know that he loves us, and we know that he'll watch over us. And so we rest in that. Would you pray with me? Father, as we look back at the book of Jonah, as it were in the rearview mirror, help us to remember, Lord, to obey you. Pretty simple. Just do what you said. It's not easy, but it's the right thing to do. And Lord, that we would not just obey you, but that we would recognize that rebellion is something that you will not ignore. So help us to be quick to confess our sins each day. And Lord, help us to remember that you're sovereign, you're large and in charge, and that you love us. Help us to be reflections of your love to those around us. We ask in Jesus' name, amen.